this is quite a busy lecture. As I mentioned on emails coming out, there's a lot that we need to go through today, so we'll kind of keep the, the initial discussion fairly short. Where are we going? As I said, it's a pretty jam-packed topic, and we need to run through it. So financial instruments. The first part of what we're going to do is actually look at what financial instruments are. Some of you guys may be doing finance. Some of you guys may not be doing finance. Some of you guys may be doing finance and still aren't too sure what these things are. Some of you guys may not be doing finance and understand these things. What we're going to do is just a high level overview of what they are and what's relevant for us. So we're going to look at fixed, in fixed income securities. We're going to look at derivative securities. We're going to look at why the accounting for these is problematic. And then we start to, we're going to start touching on the regulation. There is a huge amount of regulation around financial instruments. There's no way we would want to or we could cover all of that in one topic. So we're going to look at parts of AASB 7, 9, 132, 139, looking at fixed income securities, looking at derivatives, and looking at hedging relationships. There are three worked examples that we need to have a look at, and we shall see how we get through with each one of those. So the importance of accounting for financial instruments. Um, they're economically, economically significant. Um, so if we think about, we're not focusing on equity markets. We're not focusing on shares and the size of equity markets. What we're focusing on are debt instruments and then on derivative instruments. We don't think about the debt market so much as a big as market, big as, market as it is. This is global outstanding debt securities. So these aren't necessarily, we're not talking about just private lending from a bank. We're talking about debt securities which are, which are outstanding, which are tradable. $90 trillion worldwide of these things. So we're not talking about small amounts of money here. These are economically significant. Now, in previous lectures, I'd normally, I would then show a video about what a trillion dollars actually looks like. I will post it up online because I think it's actually a really interesting thing just to get your head around how much a trillion dollars actually is. Because um, it takes about two minutes to do it, and we unfortunately don't have that time. When we're talking about derivative securities, which is also what we'll be talking about, the no total notional outstanding in terms of derivatives as of June last year was close to $800 trillion. So again, we're talking about substantial amounts of money that we're dealing with. And what that means is, if there are different ways to account for these things, even a small difference is going to have a big impact. And that's something that we need to investigate. Some of these instruments can be really, really simple. You know, you issue equity, you, you issue public debt. That's really simple what those things are. But then they move, you know, and some of you guys may well end up doing these sort of things, creating really complex, really convoluted, now whether or not they even fit for purpose, financial instruments. Um, hybrid instruments, derivative securities, all these various exotic things which are available and out there, these are things which need to be accounted for in some way and it's not necessarily straightforward how you do it. The same instrument could also be used for different purposes. And when we get to a couple of slides time, we'll talk about one of those examples where that could be. Um, so if they're used for different purposes, the accounting may be different. Now this is simplifying. Well, these are, the, these are definitions from um, the ASX. And I'm going to give a really simplified example because it's what is critical with today, what is going to be useful for next week, um, is just being comfortable with the thing that we're actually talking about. Because if you understand the thing, the economics of it, the actual accounting for it becomes, okay, I won't say straightforward, but it becomes a lot easier to deal with. So when we're talking about bonds, it's a tradable debt security usually issued by a government or semi-government body to raise money. Holders of the bond have lent money for which they receive a fixed rate of interest over a set period of time. The bond is repaid with interest on the predetermined maturity date. I need a pen. Okay, so those are bonds. What's next? We've got debentures, which are effectively the same thing. Different name, but it's a loan 
um, at a fixed rate of interest, fixed term, usually one to five years. And in this case, it's secured over some sort of asset. And an unsecured note is a loan by the company, fixed rate of interest, fixed, per fixed period of time, but it's not secured over something. So it's generally the interest is going to be higher. But the idea is still the same. In each of these things, whether it be bonds, debentures, unsecured notes, you have the, the issuer has borrowed money from somebody. Now, we're going to use this example coming through um, for a few moments. But we'll come across as we go through the example what's called the face of the note or the face of the bond. And so in this case, can, Valentin, can you read that? No? Okay. What it says is three years, $1 million. What this means is whoever I sell this to or whoever happens to hold it, that's why they're called holders of it. I'll just borrow you for a second. You're holding that. He is the holder of that particular note or that particular instrument. That means in three years' time, I'm the person that issued it. In three years' time, I will give you $1 million. Now, I'm not that good a bloke that I'm just going to give him that so that in three years' time, I'm going to give him a $1 million. I will issue it to you and you will give me money now. So, question to you guys. I know you've had a break for a couple of weeks, well, a week and a half or so. That I'm going to give him, because he's bought it off me, a million dollars in three years' time. Would he pay me a million dollars for that now? Depends on the interest rate. Possibly. Yeah. What would the interest rate have to be to give him to, for it to be a million dollars right now? Yeah, it'd have to be zero. So, I mean, assuming we don't see zero interest rates, which actually we do see, you know, we see some of those things in certain places. Assuming it's not a zero interest rate, is he going to give me a million dollars for that right now? Probably not. He's going to give me something less. And so, what we've got is, this is a debenture. This is a zero coupon debenture or zero coupon bond where I'm not paying any other cash flows apart from the one million dollars at the end. Now, keep holding that for a moment. We shall come back to that. So that's the idea. It's just I owe him money, or I owe the holder money in a certain number of periods time. Now derivative securities um, are something different to this. And what I want you to make to see is important in this is these are contracts. And our, as we get to options, they're contracts as well. So a derivative security, when we're talking about futures and forwards, and from our point of view, these are interchangeable. I know they're different. Um, but for the accounting that we're going to be doing, for all intents and purposes, they do the same thing. A futures and a forward contract is an agreement to buy or sell an asset or cash equivalent at a date in the future at a price agreed today. So if I negotiate with someone, actually, what's your name? Aaron. Aaron. So if I arrange with Aaron to buy gold off him in six months' time and we fix the price now at, I don't know, I don't know how much gold trades for, say $50 an ounce. I don't know if that's good or bad. Cheap. Pretty cheap, so I don't know why you've agreed to that, because that's good for me. Um, if I've agreed to that now, that's a forward agreement, because we have organized something where he will have to provide that, or delivery will not actually happen. He won't actually give me that gold. We'll just settle out. But the thing is, neither of us can walk away from that. We can settle up now, and you know, we pay out the difference at this point, but we're locked into that contract. An option just like the terminology suggests, is an option to do something. So if I had an option with Aaron to buy gold at $50 an ounce, if I could get it on market at 30, I'm not gonna buy it from him. I'm not gonna exercise that option. I'm gonna buy it on market for 30. So it gives me the right to buy it from Aaron at 50, but I don't have the obligation to buy it from him if I could get it at a better price somewhere else. And those are the two types of things that we're going to be looking at for the accounting for. So why is it problematic? Okay, so one, there's a divergence in legal form and economic substance. Just because I happen to call something a share, a preference share, ordinary share, whatever, just because I happen to include share in the title or share in the name of the thing doesn't necessarily mean it's equity. What we're looking at is the actual economics of it. And when we get to the definitions of what a financial asset is, a financial liability is, an equity instrument is, then we get to see what things should be accounted for or what things should be classified in what ways. 
we know share prices go up and down as interest rates change, as various things. We see bond values go up and down, derivatives change in value based on the changes in the underlying instruments that they're dealing with. These things move around. That means we have to account for those changes. And the question with that is, then how do we account for the change? Do we have changes running through profit? Do we have changes running through OCI? Do we ignore the change? Um, as I said at the top, different parties may utilize the same instrument in different ways. So if, you, if you've heard about or talked about, and I'm sure you know in uni finance, like in finance they probably, do they talk about the GFC in first year at all? Yeah, a little bit. Can you remember what they talked about? No, uh, maybe, hopes. Oh, it's a bit sad from our point of view when you forget stuff. Okay, I mean, there's lots of arguments as to what caused the GFC and how it got so bad. Accounting is actually identified as a problem with the GFC. The fact that we use fair value or mark-to-market accounting arguably made things worse, if you, if you choose to believe that. But when they issue mortgages, and this is sort of the precursor of what happened with this, so banks could issue mortgages and they have an asset on their books. I've issued loans to all of you guys. I collect cash flows on a fortnightly or a monthly basis for the next 25 years. Now that's kind of good, you know, I've got an asset there, assuming you guys will actually pay up, there'll be money coming in. But I've got to wait 25 years for all of that to be realized. And some of these banks went, well, we actually want kind of our cash now. So all these loans I made to you guys, they would package them up and sell them off as an instrument to somewhere else. Same underlying thing which has happened, but some people may be looking to just sit and collect those cash flows. Some people may be looking to trade those cash flows. And that would argue a slightly different way to account for things. So again, it starts to become quite complex what we do. For this, this is an entree into financial instruments, so we're going to keep it relatively light with some of the details here. I say relatively because it's still a fair bit we need to go through. And if this doesn't give you an indication that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, I don't know what will. Four standards deals with financial instruments. Seven on disclosures, nine on just general. 132 on presentation and 139 on recognition and measurement. Now the reason there are so many is because this one ultimately, this is one of the new ones and nine is going to ultimately kind of deal with all of the issues around financial instruments. It's a slow process and they're slowly pulling things into it. So just recently hedging got moved into nine. Um, we're still going to deal with where hedging used to be but these things are slowly changing. <coughs> Okay, I'll preface this, we are not expecting you to read all four of those standards cover to cover. Um, it would take you forever and a day to do that. And it's still, I don't understand some of, the, some of the very detailed intricacies of what goes on in there, so it's difficult to go through all of it. But let's get, bra let's get back to some of the main detail that we need to be covering. So financial instrument, this is the basis of what we're doing today. A financial instrument is any contract, so it's a contractual relationship, that gives rise to an asset or financial asset on one side and a liability or, equi or equity instrument um, of another entity. So we've got an asset and then a liability or, or equity on the other side. So a financial asset sounds all really high powered and when we break it down it's actually not too difficult to discern. Cash is a financial asset. So when you see cash at bank, like that's a financial asset that they have. An equity instrument of another entity. So I think we probably mentioned this before. I hold Woolworth shares. So for Woolworths, that's equity. That's an equity instrument of them. But for me, that is a financial asset for me. I hold shares in Woolworths. That's a financial asset. A financial asset is any asset that is a contractual right to receive cash or another financial asset from another entity. So accounts receivable are a financial asset. The debenture that I issued, the $1 million debenture I issued, that is a finance, so from your point of view, that's a financial asset. I'm gonna keep sure, make sure that you're awake for the next few minutes. So I know you weren't on your phone though as you calculated, so that's all right. Um, this is where it starts to get a little bit, little bit tricky. And it relates to Aaron and my forward contract with gold. 
A contractual right to exchange financial assets or financial liabilities with another entity under conditions that are potentially favourable to the entity. So if I've got a forward arrangement with Aaron to receive gold, one of us is going to be in the better position as time goes on because gold prices will move and you may be up or I may be up. That is a contractual relationship and whoever is up, they will be the one with a financial asset in relation to this forward because they're the one who will receive money from the other person. Um, part D, a contract that will or may be settled in the entity's own equity instruments is not one that we worry about in this subject. A financial liability on the other side is actually fairly straightforward because we're not interested, again, we're not interested in this bit here. A contractual obligation to deliver cash. I owe $1 million in three years' time. That is a financial liability. I have to deliver that. Or, again, coming back with Aaron, to exchange financial assets or financial liabilities in a situation where the conditions are potentially unfavorable to that party. So if it all works out that I have to pay Aaron in relation to this agreement, I have a financial liability and he would have a financial asset. And we'll look through the numbers of this as we get through today. The last one we want to have a look at is an equity instrument. Now an equity instrument is any contract that evidences a residual interest in the assets of an entity after deducting all of its liabilities. Now, I hope you notice something from this. That with the other definitions, it was all, you know, contractual right to do this, or it is cash, or it's something else. This, an equity instrument, is not defined in those ways. An equity instrument is defined in relation to other things. An equity instrument is defined in relation to assets and liabilities. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Does this, does anything sort of, does this seem to link to anything that you may have done? Say first year accounting. One of the sort of bedrocks of what accounting is about. If you had John Tyler, you got you drawing, writing up in the mirror in the bathroom. What are the three elements that we have up there? What are the, what are the five accounting elements and what, what are three accounting elements? I'll give you a hint, they're on the balance sheet. Assets liabilities. Assets, liabilities, equity. If we arrange them, what do we have? The accounting, the accounting equation. What does that look like? It looks like the written terminology of the accounting equation. It's equity is assets minus liabilities. That's what an equity instrument is. Now, apart from kind of getting you thinking about first year and sort of getting your minds back on the job after, after holidays, that actually is important when it comes to measuring and accounting for convertible instruments or hybrid instruments. Um, so it, there is actually a reason why that's important. Okay. So we've issued something. Something's happened. And the issuer has to classify it as a particular thing. We do it on initial recognition as a financial liability, a financial asset, or an equity instrument <coughs> in accordance, bless you, in accordance with the substance of the contractual arrangement. Doesn't matter if I call it preferred, preferred shares. That was going to be something a lot more interesting than that. But preference shares, if I call it preference shares, they may be equity, they may not be equity. What is critical with that is what is the actual arrangement? What is the, what is the substance? Does it look like a financial liability? Do we have a contractual right to pay cash? If that's the case, it looks like we've got a liability, not necessarily equity. So that is what we're drilling down on. Uh, why did I do that? I don't know why I did that. Don't worry, didn't need that there. So fixed income securities. So when? Sorry, I should have asked, that was pretty, what's your name? James. All right, I've issued James a million dollar debenture. So when we all deal with and we're dealing now just with the financial liabilities. So financial liabilities are the focus of what we're dealing with. So from my point of view, I recognize a financial liability in my balance sheet or my statement of financial position when and only when I become a party to the contractual provisions of that instrument. So before I issue it, 
I don't owe anyone money. Once I've issued it to James and he's stumped up the money, we have an initial recognition situation. So that's a paragraph 9.3.1.1. When an entity first recognizes a financial liability, so this is on my books, I've issued money, I've issued this $1 million three-year debenture to James, I have received a certain amount of money. We don't know what that is. It shall be, it shall be classified in accordance, in accordance with paragraphs 4.2.1 and 4.2.2, and it should be measured in accordance with paragraph 5.1.1. And that's all from paragraph 9.3.1.1. <sighs> It gets fiddly. Um, you can kind of see they started to change the paragraph system. So it wasn't just like paragraph, like paragraph 30 or paragraph 30. It was paragraph 30 point something, point something. And I think they've done that because they realized that they were just adding stuff to it all the time. So they could just keep adding levels. So we've got a liability. So I've issued this to James. I've got a liability. Everyone's comfortable with that because I owe him a million dollars in three years' time. An entity shall classify all financial liabilities as subsequently measured at amortized cost using the effective interest method, except for, and we're not worried about the except for situation, so that's paragraph 9.4.2.1. Um, an entity may at initial recognition irrevoc irrevocably designate a financial liability as measured at fair value. So you do basically have a default setting where we use, we don't know what this system is, we're going to talk about it. Um, Subsequently measured at amortized cost. That is the default setting. But you can, if it's going to give you more relevant information, you can set it up at fair value. Now, a comment here. We are not looking at fair value accounting for financial liabilities. The only way that we will account for them is using this amortized cost method, which whilst it sounds scary, is actually not as bad as what it, what it looks like. Now, I would like to just... T1, T2, T3. Okay. I've issued James, and this is for you guys to put your thinking caps on here. I've issued James this bond. He has paid me a certain amount of money. We'll come up with a number in a second. That is a face value of a million dollars. So that means, and I just want you guys to think about this for a sec. What would the liability of mine be just before that final payment date? How much do I owe him just before I have to pay him? No, just before I pay him. After I pay him, then I don't owe him anything. But just before I pay him, and it's a face of a million. It's not a trick question. It's a million. The liability just before I pay him, I owe him a million dollars. That's what's on the face. Now, assuming zero rates aren't, assuming interest rates aren't zero. I'm going to, he's going to pay me something less than $1 million to get hold of that future cash flow. How much, we don't know because we don't know the rate. But let's just say, let's just say he pays me $800,000. So at time zero, this would be what I'd actually show. I would debit cash because he's given me cash of 800000 and I'd credit a financial liability of 800000 Hopefully at that point, there's nothing controversial with that. I've just showed up that I've got extra cash coming in from James and I have a liability because that is the value of that at that point in time. But this is where the question then goes. We've got to get from $800,000 at time zero to having $1 million on our books at time three because that is how much I have to repay him. This is the problem that has to be solved by the accounting because it's, we've got to get from $800,000 at time zero to $1 million at time three. So you could do nothing here, nothing here, add $200,000 here, but then that doesn't really seem to make sense because that would be a $200 expense, $200,000 expense, meaning we'd have zero expense here even though we borrowed money. We've had zero expense here even though we borrowed money. And then we show this big expense in the third year. Do we just go 
200, what's that, 67,000. We could just go 67,000 and just equal it out across those, that time period. Um, we don't do that either. What we, fair value is another way we do it, and it's actually looking at what is the fair value at this point and making an adjustment, what is the fair value at this point, what is the fair value at that point. That's not what we're going to do. What we do and what gets commonly done is this amortized cost method. Now, if any of you have been and looked at things like home loan calculators, which you may or may not have done, I don't, maybe a little bit too early on the piece, may not be. This is the same sort of process. If you're paying principal and interest repayments, as you pay the same amount over time, the amount of the interest expense starts to decrease and the amount of principal repayment starts to increase. That's the same thing that we're about to go through. So at initial recognition, we measure a financial liability at its fair value. Now, for, for a straight debt instrument, that's pretty easy for us because that will just be the amount of money that in this case, James would pay to get access to that. Assuming we're using the amortized cost using the effective interest, interest method, not fair value. Just read this out. The amortized cost of a financial liability is the amount of which the financial liability is measured at initial recognition. So we're thinking that 800 with James minus principal repayments. So again, thinking home loans, it kind of comes in there. Plus or minus accumulated cumulative amortization using the effective interest method of any difference between that initial amount and the maturity amount. So what that effective interest method is basically doing, as I'll come back to it, is getting it from here up to the million and picking up using a rate that will get us there relatively smoothly. And we're going to see this in action because it makes a lot more sense with numbers involved. Now, they actually define and go through in detail what the effective interest method is in paragraph 9. I didn't show it up on the slide because if you thought that was too much text, this would take up the entire screen, if not more so. So I would urge you to go and have a look at it. But what we're about to do is actually deals with that situation. So if you turn to the first example, if I can get this working. There we go. Move some of this. Get rid of that. Okay, so what we have here, and I'll flick back to, so once we've, you guys should all have this in front of you, and once we've had a look at it, I'll do the answers up in a different space. Um, so we have Wellesley Limited seeking to raise cash for the purchase of an airplane, and does so by issuing debentures on the 1st of, where's the pen? On the 1st of July, um, 2014. The debentures have a face of five million, A coupon rate of 8% and a term of three years. Coupons are paid annually in arrears. At the time of issue, the market rate is 10%. So the first thing we need to do is to go, what is the fair value of this instrument? Because if it is a pure debt instrument, like what we have here, you won't be given that number. Okay. <clears throat> Coupon eight percent. Uh, what else is the market? Okay, so this is the information we have from this particular example. Remember, the face is not how much is raised. The face is how much has to be repaid at the end. So what we're trying to do is construct a cash flow, a series of cash flows here, and then come up with the present value of them. So we have time one, time two, time three. 
This is coupon bearing. And what the coupon basically does is tell you how much the cash flow is each year, in this case, each year. So that should be up there. So the coupon is 8% paid annually. And it's worked out as 8% times the face. So in that case, we have 400,000. We have 400,000. And we have 400,000. So those are the cash flows, plus the repayment of the face at time three. So we have a T1, 400,000, T2, 400,000, T3, 400,000, plus five million. The discount rate you use is not the coupon rate. The discount rate you use is the market discount rate. So the only thing you use that 8% for is figuring out this cash flow of 400,000. Once you've got that, you can get rid of it because you don't need it anymore. That is literally the only thing you use it for. And then it is purely and simply a present value cash flow calculation. So we've got three cash flows or we've got an annuity and a final cash flow, however you want to cut it. And when you present value it at 10%, you should get, and we're not going to go through the mechanics of it here and now, but you should get 4.751315. And this is the fair value of the instrument. Okay. That gives you the debit cash credit debentures that you start with. The next step, and you've got it sitting there as the liability amortization schedule, and we'll work through, I'll work through the first line of it so everyone's comfortable with what we're seeing. Um, and then it is just repeats itself. So for year one, we have an opening, and we simply put Okay, that interest expense that you have there, you simply take the opening balance and multiply it by the market rate. Now, I just will make a comment on this very quickly because I realize there's a typo in here. I did update, I have updated the examples as of today. So if you get the, if you get the example as of this afternoon, it will be right. But I've got, a, I've transposed the five and the one. So. It should be 4.751 million. You may have 4.715 million. That's incorrect, but that was me stuffing up. But the interest component for that first year, okay. that's, that's stage door. Can't come in there. Um, 475131. So this is 10% of the opening. So that's the market rate times the opening. The payment is easy. The payment is just whatever the cash flow is. So the 400,000. <coughs> you don't really need the change column. I mean, you can put it in if you want, but it's not crucial. The change column is just the difference between the interest and the payment columns. So in this case, 75131, and what you end up with is a closing. Now, you may not be too sure about whether you should add or you, or you should subtract this. One thing which will tell you what you need to do, really simply, and so it's actually better to know what overall what you meant to do rather than to try to remember some absolute rule, is at the end of it, after three years, we have to get to 5 million. So we start with 4.71, we've got to end with 5. That's the problem that we had. So like with James, we started at 800, we ended up at a million. We've got to be adding in his case. And in this case, we're going from 4.75 to 5, we're adding that difference. Now, if any of you guys have got credit cards, you'll know exactly why this is. Think about what's happening here. Say you've made no, say you max out your card and you can't make any new purchases on it, but you're only making the minimum payment. Or you're not even covering, you're definitely not covering interest. You're incurring $475,000 of interest expense each year. 
but you're only paying off 400,000, you are going to be adding to your balance. That's that from just a realistic perspective, that's what we're seeing. You're paying 400 grand, you're incurring more interest than that, your balance is just going to go up. You can see the reverse situation where you're actually paying more than your interest expense and your balance will be going down. So it works both ways. In this case, we're going up, so we're adding it, and we end up with 4826 point, not point. And that comes down into the second year. Nope. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Vagaries of technology. 4826. And then you just repeat the process. You guys have got the full workout on your, on your example. So 4715, that is the opening balance. That is the initial fair value of the liability that we created from up there. Interest is the market rate times that opening balance. Payment is just how much you're paying in the coupon. This is just taking the difference between these two. This is just adding that difference to the opening amount. You end up with the closing, the closing becomes next year's opening and you literally repeat that process. Go down the next year, repeat that process. If you can do it once, you can do it 20 times. Um, we're not going to get you to do it. To, we're not going to get you to do it 20 times because it really be a waste of everyone's time. Um, but that is the process. You need to be fairly comfortable with that process. Convertible instruments use the same process. When we do leases next week, they use the same process. This is something you will see a few times. So the accounting for it. I'm just going to do again the first year, and again, apologies. I've kind of made a bit of a boo-boo in this. Um, so this is what you should have. Debit interest expense. This is picking up, where is it? That's picking up this column. So whatever is in this column for the particular year that you're looking at, literally just debit expense. Credit, cash. If there's anything you should get from this, you should be able to get credit cash because there is literally $400,000 of cash going out of the business. So cash is the next column. So that payment column, whatever is in that payment column, that goes into credit cash. If you've got the older workup of the example, you will see I've got cash and debenture the wrong way around. Again, that was an apology from me. And credit debenture, you are adding to the liability. Again, you can see this a lot clearer here. You've incurred an interest expense of 475. You haven't paid that full interest expense off. You've only paid $400,000 of it. You are, you are capitalizing that interest expense, and that gets added to it. Um, when we come down right to the end, and you repeat that for all the years you need to, when you come right to the end, debit debenture, because I owe $5 million, I pay it off, so the liability comes down, credit cash, $5 million and everything's squared away. Um, it is a process. Get the, fight, get the fair value up front and everything just rolls out pretty neatly. All right. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing we're gonna have a look at now Actually, coming back to just pure bonds and debentures, BHP in the last couple of weeks have issued a billion, just issued a billion dollars in debentures. I think it's debentures, bonds, whatever they call it. There's a link to that up on our social media. So I mean, this stuff does happen. 
Compound Financial Instruments, NAB, have just issued $750 million worth of hybrid securities. These are, you know, they're not just random things we're talking about. These are things which have been issued in the market at the moment. So a convertible bond. Where is... All right, James, can I have that piece of paper back? Because you're being upsold. So let's just remember this. It's a million dollars. I'm going to give it's zero coupon. So there's no payments in between. It's just literally I will give James a million dollars or whoever holds this a million dollars at time three. But then because I'm feeling generous or I want to raise more money. I will not just give him an op, I will give him the three year one, three year $1 million face bond, but I will also give him the option. And so it's an option. He doesn't have to exercise it if he doesn't want. I give you a conversion option attached to that, which allows him, if he wants, not to receive a million dollars in three years time. He could choose to elect to receive shares in my business. Now, we don't know what my business is. Maybe a really terrible business, so you may not want those shares. But that's all right, because it's an option for him. Question for everyone else. The straight debt instrument, he would pay me $800,000 for that. Let's, for argument's sake, say it is. Do you think with that attached, he's going to pay more or less than $800,000? He's going to pay more? Yeah. Yep. Anyone agree with that? Yep. Makes sense. If you get something additional, you'll pay more for it. If you buy a car or buy a car with SatNav, I think those aren't standard yet, um, you'll pay more, slightly more for that. Um, the question that we have here now is, so that's what a convertible bond is, a bond convertible by the whole thing to a fixed number of ordinary shares. It has two bits to it. It has the $1 million face, it has a, it has a bond instrument, the contractual arrangement to deliver cash, and it has a call option sitting over the top, which is an equity instrument. So let's just for argument's sake say he would pay $850,000. I'm going to debit cash $850,000. Should I credit liability $850,000? Should I credit equity $850,000? Should I stay really quiet and just see what he'll say? Let's, let's run with that. When something like this is issued for a non-derivative financial instrument, you evaluate the terms of it. And in this case, if it contains both a liability and an equity component, we record these things separately. So what we have is, I will record the fact that there is a financial liability but I'll also record the fact that part of that 850,000 relates to an equity instrument. Then the question is, how much of that 850 should be a liability, how much should be equity? I thought I'd put an extra, oh, I know what I did. Okay. So with this one, we'll look to top example two. And we don't have to go through the entire example, which is really nice, because there's only it actually pretty much works the same as what we just did with a slight with a slight twist at the front. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to work mostly off this. Okay, so in this case, it's the same, essen same essential things which have gone on. Raising money, the bonds have a face value of a million, same face value. Coupon rate of 8%, same coupon rate. Term of three years, that's the same. Annual in arrears, that's the same. The market rate is 10%, that's the same. The only additional information that we really have is, is they have a conversion option and the issue price. So we have the same information as before, plus a conversion option, plus an issue price. Because for this sort of question, you need to be told how much money was raised. You can't work it out independently in this case. So we will tell you they raised X amount of money. And in this case, because they were issued at face, the face is 5 million, 
And how much was raised is also 5 million. Which is good, because when we come to the debit cash bit down here, that's 5 million. The question that we have is, we know we have a liability, we know we have equity, is how to split that up. And how we split that up is just to look at the fair value of the li financial liability. And the fair value of the financial liability is the cash flows for that financial liability discounted at the market rate. And which we've already done that because it's the same set of cash flows. The financial liabilities, or the fair value of the financial liability, is a 4715, 4751, 315. So that is the liability component. That's what we credit to liability down here. That means we have a residual amount. That is what equity, that is what an equity instrument is defined as. It's that residual amount. Um, we don't actually independently measure the value of that equity. We just go, we know you know, if you're going out to buy a car and it's like, if it's $30,000 without sat-nav and it's $31,000 with sat-nav, that's a very expensive sat-nav. Um, that's the idea. You can tell that it's $1,000 because of the difference between the two. With James's example, $800,000 for the liability, eight fifty dollars with the, with, the, with the equity or the conversion option. The conversion option in his case was fifty. dollars In this case, they've paid a million. They would have paid four hundred, four, sorry, $5 million they would have paid 4.75 just for the liability. So they're willing to pay close to a quarter of a million dollars to get this option to get equity in the business. That's how we've come up with that number. And then once you've come up with that number, you can actually pretty much ignore it for most of the rest of what we have to do. This is the same. This is the same. This is the same. The only bit where it differs, the only bit where it differs is when they convert. If they don't convert, we don't have to do anything. If they convert, there's no more liability. So whatever the liability value is at the day of conversion, that liability is gone because they're not going to be receiving cash flows anymore. So that disappears. The equity component disappears because that conversion option is now no longer an equity component within this line item, it gets converted into the share capital. So this is equity turning into, ec into other equity, and this is liability turning into equity. So we, that's all that happens. So you're just looking at the balance of the liability and the balance of the equity at the time of conversion, getting rid of them completely, and then rolling it into whatever the share capital is. Yeah, so you're converting. Okay, so the whole is converted. And say, just say that again. Yep. Because you convert it, because you're taking, you're converting into shares in the business. So it's, it's almost akin to saying you... Yeah, so this is from my this is my perspective. So I've issued this to you. So at the moment I've issued it to you, so I've got this liability sitting on sitting on my books. Now what's happening there, the other if we didn't convert, we would be debiting we'd be debiting to venture crediting cash. So I'd be having cash going out of the business. So it's it's pretty much like I'm paying for this settlement, not in terms of cash, but I'm using my equity to settle it out. If that makes sense. So I'm I'm 
So you now have shares in my business. It's diluting everyone else a little bit, but it's bringing me up to, like it's showing that I now have more share capital because I've, issued, I've effectively issued shares to you. Another way to do it is if you, because if you thought this business was good, you could also take, you could cash out and then buy shares in the business with existing shares. So you'd still end up with shares, but this way, I mean, I think you avoid some costs of doing it and it just may be easier to do. Um, so yeah, but that's, hopefully that explained it. Right, final thing. That's our final thing. There's a bit of stuff we need to cover in hedging relationships. Right. <clears throat> We'll go through some of the commentary about it and then we'll look at some situations. So hedge accounting. It's, I won't lie, there are, some, there are lots of, in reality, this gets quite complicated. In what we're doing, we're gonna keep it as narrow as we can. I mean, it's still not necessarily gonna be easy, but there's some things that we need to cover. So hedge accounting. This is important, is hedge accounting doesn't guarantee profits. Hedge accounting doesn't mean that you won't, always, you won't ever have losses. Um, what hedge accounting does is to try to lock in a price. You may have been better off not taking out a hedge with a particular situation. Um, so when we're talking about hedge accounting, it's this idea that if I owe, and we'll use foreign currency a little bit, if I owe someone overseas money, so if I owe someone in the US money and the Australian dollar weakens against the US dollar, I will have to pay more Aussie dollars to settle that. Because if I owe someone $100,000 US and the Aussie dollar weakens, I'll still have to pay them $100,000 US, but I'll have to pay more Aussie to settle that out. Hedge accounting recognizes the offsetting effects on profit or loss when you have a hedged item, which in this case is the foreign currency payable, and you take out some sort of forward or take out some sort of option situation, which allows you, as the Australian dollar drops, you'll be losing in that situation, but you'd be winning on the forward situation. And you sort of net those two things out. A comment with this, as I mentioned at the top, WSB 9 financial instruments was issued last year. It's gonna take a while before it comes into effect, so we will keep using 139. Um, and that also is useful because the textbook uses 139. So don't worry about nine for hedging for this. So we have a hedging instrument. So we've got a designated derivative. Now, I am planning on going to the US in August. Some of you guys may be planning to go overseas in the summer, not well, maybe up to the north, um, up to Europe, up to the US during their summer holidays. You may be looking to go somewhere else. Now the thing is, I'm worried, I actually am generally worried about the Australian dollar dropping between now and then, because if it drops, I'm gonna be out more money. So what is some way, I'm thinking that I could mitigate that risk? What is something I could do right now, apart from taking out some sort of derivative, because I'm not gonna do that. What is another way in which you can offset or sort of prevent or set up a situation so that I'm not worried about this, the Australian dollar, US dollar exchange rate? I could buy US dollars right now. If I buy US dollars right now, I know exactly the rate that I'm gonna get. So if I went out and bought $1,000 US right now, I'd get it, I'd change it, I know what I paid for it. If the Australian dollar weakens, I don't care. If the Australian dollar strengthens, well, that would be really frustrating. But, and that's what we're talking about. If the Australian dollar strengthens, I'd, I would have been better off not doing it. But the thing is, I don't know that was gonna, if I knew it was gonna happen, then I wouldn't take out the hedge. But I didn't know that was gonna happen. Um, for example, Qantas, is actually fuel prices and airline and aircraft fuel prices have dropped and dropped substantially. Qantas didn't hedge a lot of their fuel exposure. So they've actually been able to make a lot of money on that because they've been able to buy fuel at a lower price. Virgin, on the other hand, fully hedged their exposure. And I'll put up a, a link to this, which means as the fuel price went down, they did well there, but their hedged position lost money. So they actually didn't really do any good out of it at all. So a designated derivative, so we're dealing with a hedged instrument because to actually buy the US currency right now, I need to have all the Aussie on me to buy it, which that means it's locked up for the next few months. And I don't necessarily want that. 
So the designated derivative, and that's fair value of the cash flows of it, are expected to offset changes in the fair value of cash flows of the designated hedged item. The hedged item is an asset liability firm commitment or highly probable forecast transaction or net investment in a foreign operation that exposes the entity to risks in changes in fair value or future cash flows and is designated as being hedged. <coughs> so examples of this. Foreign currency receivable. Somebody is going to pay you and they're basing on and it's based in a foreign currency. Liability, foreign currency liability, foreign currency payable. You owe foreign currency. There is a risk there because if foreign exchange rates move, you'll have an issue. We'll talk about the other two in a second. A firm commitment. My trip to the US is not a firm commitment. I could walk, I haven't booked anything, I haven't done anything, I haven't paid for anything, I haven't done anything at all. I could walk away from it. A firm commitment is a binding agreement. So it is locked in, it is gonna happen. A forecast transaction is an uncommitted but anticipated future transaction. That is my US trip. I'm anticipating going, but I'm not locked into going. And that does have an effect as we look down as what we're about to do. <coughs> okay. Partly what, uh, okay. Where are we? We'll talk about forwards and futures in a second, but let's just imagine we have an option on the books. And the thing is with options, you actually buy them. So this would be something we'd have this as the initial transaction. It's a financial asset. We debit option 150, credit cash 150. So we enter into an option situation, we'd buy the option. Entering into a forward or future is slightly different. 150, we have as an asset on the books. That's initial recognition. What we're worried about then is how it gets dealt with after that fact. Now, as you go through the standard, there are four types of financial instruments. A financial asset or liability at fair value through profit or loss, a hold to maturity investment, loans and receivables are available for sale financial assets. As you go through those definitions, if you look at them in detail, held, hold to maturity loans and receivables and available for sales are technically not derivatives. They specify they cannot be derivative items. The only way in which a derivative can be accounted for is through fair value, through profit or loss. So if this happens to be worth 180, we would debit option 30, credit gain 30. If it dropped in value, we'd show that as a loss. That's Oh, that's it. That's how you deal with, with options and with forwards, with derivatives in general. But hedging adds a layer of, a slight layer of complexity to it. If it is a designated hedging relationship, then depending on the relationship type, that accounting will be slightly different. And it will follow paragraphs 89 to 102. And the assumptions we're making are, is that we've met all the, all the requirements to have it as a hedge relationship and the relationship is effective. That's not always gonna be the case, but for us, we are assuming that is. So moving on, the types. And I'll define them and then we'll actually draw up something which I think explains it fairly well. So the definitions for a fair value hedge is a hedge of the exposure to changes in the value of a recognized asset or liability. So that's for us, the key thing. You have a recognized asset or liability. When we talk about recognized as opposed to disclose, where does recognized thing, where do they end up? On the balance sheet. We are looking for something on the balance sheet. If it is not on the balance sheet, this becomes critical. If it's not on the balance sheet, for us, it is not dealing with a fair value hedge. For a cash flow hedge, it's not about being on the balance sheet. For us, again, there's, there's more details about it. A hedge of the exposure to variability in cash flows attributable to a particular risk associated, or, and this is for us, or it's a highly probable forecast transaction. So it is something which hasn't happened yet. But the thing is, I'm worried about when I go to the US, 
I'm worried about Australian the foreign currency rates changing. I have, there's been no transactions yet, but I could still take out a position now to offset any, any effects down the line. There's nothing recognised on my books at this point. So we're going to have a look at how, what they actually mean. The hedge of a net investment in a foreign operation is something we're not worried about. Right, so what I'll do is... Okay, so let's actually look at what's happened here. So, Okay, we've got three points in time. And this is fairly rough. So at time zero, we anticipate buying foreign, foreign, buying imagery and we're gonna be buying it from somewhere overseas and we're gonna be paying in foreign currency. So there's foreign currency risk. At this point in time, we actually buy the inventory but we haven't paid for it, but we owe foreign currency. And at this point in time, we actually pay off the foreign currency. So there's risk between when we anticipate so when we actually pay it off, that if foreign currency rates move, that we're going to be paying more or less. There's a risk there that foreign currency rates are moving. But this is the only point where we have on the books a foreign currency payable. So if you think back to what we did a couple of weeks ago, the entry for the, for the actual inventory purchase would be debit inventory credit, I don't know, we'll call it foreign currency payable. Then we would have debit or credit FX payable, debit or credit, that should be loss or gain, you get my drift. Um, so as foreign currency rates move for the foreign currency payable, which is the recognised liability that we're looking at, as the rates change between time one and time two, we're going to be picking up some sort of gain or loss in that period of time. And then when we pay it, we'll be debiting the payable and crediting cash. Importantly, there is a profit and on loss effect in this period of time. Now I'm going to ask you guys, this is important and it relates to 121 which we looked at in foreign currency. In relation to the inventory purchase, is there any transaction which happens at time zero? Do we record anything at this point in time? No, nothing happens. We're anticipating buying it. We don't have a debit or credit for an anticipation. Nothing happens at this point. So there's zero happening here, which means is there a profit or loss effect or any sort of effect happening between this point in time and this point in time? No, nothing happens at this point. So even if foreign currency rates dropped massively, we wouldn't see any sort of profit or loss happening here. We just, pay, we just have a, a higher amount of inventory that we're buying in. And then we come through to this point. Now, this period of time, if we take out a hedge here, or we take out some sort of position at this point in time, this will change in value as we move into this point. This point in time here is the cash flow hedge because there is an anticipated future transaction. We do not have a recognised asset or liability on our books at this point. The recognised asset or liability happens at time one. So before the transaction takes place, from the underlying perspective, we have a cash flow hedge. Once this point is being reached, or if you took out the hedge to start with at this point, we have a foreign currency payable. That is a recognised asset liability and that changes in relation to foreign currency risk. Oops. 
So as we move along here, do, 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 and we'll see the accounting for this in a sec. That is a fair value hedge. Now we haven't talked about whether we go to profit and loss in each one, but I'll, we'll see the, the definite what happens. But in this case, any changes in the option or the forward or future, whatever we're looking at, that goes to profit and loss. Because what you're doing is offsetting the profit and loss effect which happens up there. So you need a profit and loss effect for a fair value hedge. But in this case, there is no profit and loss effect in the underlying because there's no transaction. So what we're picking up in the cash flow situation is we cannot have so this does go through to profit and loss, and these two will offset each other. In this case, there is no profit and loss happening up here. There was no transaction. So in this case, it'll actually come through to OCI, because if we put it into profit and loss, it would actually create volatility in the statements which we don't actually want. So the critical point for us, and it's not the only time this takes place, but for us, it's the purchase of the inventory. It's this which creates the interesting point. Before this, any hedge or any derivative position taken out before this is a cash flow hedge. Any position taken after this is a fair value hedge. That's probably the easiest way to remember that stuff. Um, what's the problem with volatility? With with volatility, okay. The whole point about hedging is to reduce risk. So I want to sort of lock in what I'm doing. Now the thing is, let's imagine, I'm gonna use a different color here. Um, and these are made up numbers. But let's imagine, let's say in this case, in the underlying, this led to a loss of 20. This wouldn't perfectly offset it, but let's say it, gave us a profit, a gain here of 18. So in this period, instead of showing a loss of 20, we'd show overall a loss of two. So it's not as bad, it's still a loss, but it's not as bad as what it used to be. How much loss are we showing? In this case here, what's our, what's prof, what is our profit and loss effect? Yeah, it's nothing. There is no profit and loss effect in this period of time, in this situation. But if we take out the hedge here, you may have a situation where it goes up by five for whatever it, you know, just rates, things are moved so that's now worth more. If you were allowed to take that five into profit and loss, instead of showing a zero profit, you'd be showing a profit of five. So you've created volatility in what's going on. So instead of sort of tracking along that nothing happening, you're creating this extra movement. The point of it is, we're trying to offset these two amounts to get you down into this much smaller amount. There's nothing happening up the top there, and if we create this profit and loss effect, we're suddenly, instead of having very little happening, we're having quite big movements taking place. And that's why you can't take it through profit and loss. That's why that $5, in this case, would go through OCI to sort of smooth it out. Um, and so fair value hedges, that just tells you that you take it into profit or loss. With cash flow hedges, it takes it into other comprehensive income. So that just codifies what I'm talking about, James. What's that? Forwards, yeah, forwards, futures, options. Guys, can we just bring it down a little bit? No, we're not talking about exercise. We're talking at exercise, and then once you exercise it, then you just—we're not talking about exercising. We're talking about just holding it, and as it changes, it just. So we're talking about the time period of holding it. Yeah, we're talking about hold. We're talking about when we buy it and as we hold it. So if we were to buy an option, we'd bring it on at say 150, and then as it changes in value over the time that we hold it, we're picking up those changes in value. Because options do change in value as you move along. And that's, that's a, if it is a cash flow hedge, it goes through OCI. This is one where it does take a little bit to get your head around. Now, 
we're not going to be able to do the full example, and I will put a video together for it because I think it will be apps. This is a topic I was worried about because, as I said, this would normally be a two-hour long topic, and we've, you know, there is a lot of content in it, so there will be something additional. But I won't talk about this right now. What I want to focus on is something in the example. So if you flip to example three, So I appreciate you bearing with me. It is the first week back. I understand that. This is a difficult topic. Probably not the nicest lead in after the break, but it is what it is. And so what we have here, the first paragraph is exactly the same as the work that we did last week, or the work that we did in foreign currency. That's the same situation. That's the same situation. The left-hand side is lecture seven from last, from before the break. There's no different. It's, it's word for word the same. Now with this, we're not going to go through the whole thing, but I do want to point out some important aspects of it. Guys, thank you. Don't make me come around. Okay, because of concerns about movements in exchange rates, the foreign exchange rates, on the 12th of June 2014, they entered into a forward rate contract with, for US dollars with a foreign exchange broker, so to receive $100,000 on the 13th of July 2013, 15th of July. So what this is saying, and I'll summarize it, We're not even looking at whether or not this is a forward or f whether what we're doing with it is a fair value or a cash flow hedge. What we're worried about is actually coming up with a value or the forward or the future. So on the 12th of June 20, 2013, we have a contract taken out. And that contract is for delivery in a couple of months time or a month's time of US dollars. So what we have here is actually a financial asset which is which is $100,000 US in the future. That is what we're going to receive. Don't think about it as cash. Think about it as an asset. We're going to receive something in the future. And we have a financial liability because we have to pay. This is just from the question information. That that information doesn't matter whether the 12th of June, at the 15th of June, at the 30th of June, at the 10th of July. That information is the same. At the 15th of July, we have a financial asset of receiving $100,000 US and we will pay $107,320. Now, there's a couple of things which are important with this. One, if we're an Australian company, can we show US dollars on our balance sheet? No, which means we need to convert that into its value in Australian dollars, which at the 12th of June is using the forward rate for that delivery. So we're at this point, this is what it's valued at, and that will give you 107,320. That payment is 107,320. This is happening like a month away. Time value of money is not relevant here. That gives you a net amount of zero. Now the thing is, what we've just done then, so at the 12th of June, and if you look on the next page on the solutions, you'll see on the 12th of June for the hedge, there is no entry. And there's no entry because what we're allowed to do in this particular situation is set off the amount. And what setting off means is we're netting it out. So imagine, because I know Vincent. 
Okay, who's sitting next to you? Patrick. Patrick. Yeah. Vincent, Patrick, are you guys friends? Oh, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> are you friendly enough that you would lend each other money? Have you lent each other money before? No. <laughs> Fine, that doesn't really work. Let's just assume you are friendly enough that you would be willing to lend each other money. So, Vincent, you lend Patrick $30. Patrick, you lend Vincent $50. No, you don't have to do it right now. I thought you were playing you. You don't do it right now. Forget which way. So $30, you've, you've lent someone $30. Vincent, you lent Patrick $30. Patrick's lent Vincent $50. When it came to settling all that out, do you think you'd actually pull out of your pocket $50 and then you'd pull out of your pocket $30 and you'd swap it both over? Or you'd just pay him 20 bucks? Probably the $20. That's probably the way it would work out. I'm assuming it would be the way it would work out. I'm assuming you're both good for it and you would actually pay each other. What you've just done then is net off the amounts because the counterparties are the same. So you would have an asset and a liability. So you would have an asset of $30, a financial asset of $30, and a financial liability of $50. You would have a financial asset of $50 and a financial liability of $30. But because they're with the same counterparty, you're allowed to set that off against each other. That's what we're doing up here. Because whoever we've got the forward agreement with, we have a financial asset from them and a financial liability with them. And because it's dealing with the same situation, and because it, the timing of it is the same, we're allowed to set those two amounts off. So instead of showing a financial asset of 107 and a financial liability of 107, it's with the same person, so we're just going zero. It all nets out. With the 16th of June, and I'm just gonna do one the next period just to, to pick up a point that you'll see here. You're still going to be getting $100,000 US and you're still going to be paying 107,320 Australian. Bless you. So this is still 307. But the financial asset, you're still getting US dollars of the same amount, but the value of the US dollars has changed. Or it probably has changed because the rates have changed. 105,550. 105, so the value of the future US dollars is now 105,550. So the asset that you have, and again, we're going from our point of view, from their point of view, it would be reversed. From our point of view, we have a financial asset of 105,550. We have a financial liability of 107. This for us is an unfavorable situation. We're paying more to get this thing than it's worth. But because we can't walk away from it, we're stuck doing it. And so it's an unfavorable situation. It's a contractual, contractual situation. And that amount is... is that right? You've got an extra five on this. Do I have an extra five in there somewhere? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Thank you. Because I was going, that doesn't add up. So that is... So that nets out at 1820. And that would be a financial liability because you're in the unfavorable situation. And that links to the definition of a financial liability that we looked at right at the start. Now, what you would see there is you would have some sort of entry. And you would credit, we'll just call it financial liability, 1820. Because it's a liability, the liability is going up, it's 1820. What we debit depends on the type of hedge relationship that it is. In this case, I know because this particular contract has been taken out before the purchase of the inventory, which means it would be a cash flow hedge relationship. And because it's a cash flow hedge relationship, it doesn't go into profit and loss, it goes into OCI. And so what you would see is debit OCI, God, I'm hoping this is what I've got on the next page. Approved. Okay, I've called it head. Okay, so I've taken it into what the account would be. Um, so we go into an OCI account, and what you see is the debit cash flow hedge reserve, so an OCI account, 1820, credit forward rate contract, 1820, and that's the financial liability, that's the OCI account. Now, what happens here? And it relates to one of the final slides that you got there, and then we'll, and I'll let you have a look at what happens after this on your own time. But when the transaction takes place, 
you are allowed to move OCI out of OCI and you can put it into a number of places, one of those being you can actually put it against the inventory itself. So in this case, it's being recycled, what they call recycling. When you take something out of OCI and put it somewhere else, it's called recycling. When you recycle this OCI out, we've got it rid of out of the hedge reserve. So the hedge reserve is now gone and we put it against the inventory. Alternatively, you could have put it against profit and loss if you want. It's the same process. You're looking to come up with a value and then change that financial asset or financial liability. Have a look at what you need to do with it. Um, but as I said, I will try to put together a video for you. Um, that's what we covered. Next week, I will be away from leases, so please turn up for Rob. He is a good bloke and he knows what he's talking about. For those in the 8 p.m. tutorial, I will see or 8 7:30 tutorial. I will see you up there with your exams in a few moments. Otherwise, all the best for the weekend.